Leave it to me to come out of a hiatus to hop on a currently popular trend. It's been a good number of days at the time of writing that Smiling Friends has come out all at once on Adult Swim to resounding applause and acclaim. Critics love it, audiences love it, and hopefully Adult Swim loves it because oh my friggin' gee, I really, really, really want this show to be picked up for another season. Smiling Friends oozes humour, creativity, imagination, and a distinct and memorable voice that is so separate from everything else that is currently airing in the world of adult animation. And people are picking up on that. As of right now, people are definitely coming out of the woodwork to talk about this show, and as is typical, I fully anticipate to be left in its wake. The show is done, the discussion has been had, and what more is there to say when the well of talking points has dried up? The answer is very little, when your focus is mainly on how the show is quality-wise. There's only so many ways to say, it was good, without regurgitating or cannibalizing the words of somebody else. But I don't necessarily plan on doing that. My days of being a vulture with a lazy work ethic are long behind me. Well, maybe not the work ethic part. Y yeah, scratch that. I'm not making this video to purely hop on a trend or be the first to talk about this show. Yeah, I'm not a liar, that's obviously part of the motive. But I've been looking forward to this show for over a year. And I've been looking forward to seeing a mainstream fully developed series from some of my favourite YouTube animators for far longer than a year now. If you know who Zack Cato and Michael Cusack are, but more specifically Zack, then you understand why this show is such a big deal. Michael Cusack is undeniably a talented creator who has earned his spot in every level of media he is a part of. Bush World and Yellow Crystal Fantasy are some of the best stuff Adult Swim has produced. Even though Michael out of the duo is the least popular, it's evident he's probably the one who has had the most profitable career. Michael's cartoons were picked up by domestic networks for short syndication, he got a chance to create his own short for one of the most popular shows of all time. He got his own show greenlit by one of the most ambitious adult animation networks in the industry. I'm of course generalizing and maybe even blinded by bias. Michael was never really somebody I grew up with or admired to the extent of Psychic Pebbles. And yes, I know not everyone who tuned in to catch Smiling Friends is an internet goblin who spends all of his time inside trying to recapture the glory days of old online animation. Most people don't know what a Newgrounds is. Most people don't know what a Psychic Pebbles is. I have people that have watched this show and know of the people behind it but aren't really super aware of the creators portfolios or what went into making the show what it is today or why its success is so important. Zack Hadel, or Psychic Pebbles, has had a notorious uphill battle in getting a show to call his own, which involved a lot of self-discovery, networking and rejected concepts. The unfortunate reality of the entertainment industry is that a lot of it is run and dictated by nepotism. And to be honest, that's true for most things. I for one have been presented opportunities and met people who I never would have met if I didn't know a guy to get me where I'm at. You think your favourite film director got the job he got because he worked for it? A little bit yeah, but for the most part it was because he knew a famous guy's wife. The difficulty of starting from the ground up is not something to be understated and probably the most humble of origins is to be somebody stuck in their bedroom making stuff for the sake of it. Zack Hadel was one of those people. He was somebody who was making stuff just because it was fun to make and because it was a form of art he really loved and admired. Through that he met other like-minded people who formed their own group and made their own stuff and had fun, it was great. One of these people was Chris O'Neill of Only NG fame, who he frequently collaborated with and the two helped with each other's cartoons until eventually, in 2012, they both decided to try their hand at something a little more official and ambitious. That being, Hellbenders. The show's base premise is that two boys, Chris and Zack, go around and have adventures doing mundane stuff that attracts some kind of wild, otherworldly element, like going and doing Christmas caroling, which results in a guy being killed by a yeti and Jesus coming down to try and abduct Zack, or the two going to find apples to sell on the black market so that they have enough money to pay their bills so that they don't get get evicted, I guess. Zack and Chris networked the show around for a while before eventually having a pilot be ordered by a mainstream TV network, which unfortunately went nowhere. The duo did a lot of work for it, including a show bible, a whole season's worth of material and so on. With that work and dedication from their end, they had very little support from the studio. They received a staggeringly little budget of $20,000 to cover animation costs. Which to put into perspective, at the time a minute's worth of average studio quality animation usually costs about 10k, meaning they had barely enough money to animate a 2 minute pilot, let alone a 15 minute one. As well as the boniest to skeleton crews that pretty much only consisted of Chris and Zack and a few friends who were willing to provide outside help for what I can assume is a small percentage of the budget. The pilot was never finished or picked up and it lay dormant on Zack's channel until eventually being released into the wilds after his network was hacked. Chris and Zack intended for this to be an ambitious project that would lead into something more mainstream than the niche that is YouTube and Newgrounds animation. But here's the unfortunate reality. That ambition is kind of what killed Hellbenders in the first place. Now I'm going to say something that is probably going to be 
very controversial and divisive that will most likely have some people think I'm an idiot or just plain not good. But I don't think Hellbender should have or had any chance of being picked up. Now don't get me wrong, I like Hellbenders, it's wacky, it's funny at points, and I've got a lot of nostalgia for it. But if I'm detaching my own personal bias, I think it's a series that could only work on the internet. Hellbenders is interesting because following it you actually start to see Zack's style and humour evolve into what it is today. Autor theory are the words of the hour, ladies and gentlemen. The term basically is used to describe any artist who has a distinct and consistent approach across all of their art. Usually this is used when talking about film, but let's generalize this more to apply to Zack. Is Zack Hado an auteur? As in, does he have a distinct and memorable style consistent across what he's worked on? I would say yes, yes, and absolutely yes. Looking at his post Hellbenders work, it's easy to narrow down the kind of stuff that prevails throughout each one of his things. They are use of a lot of weird and out there looking characters with hyper exaggerated features, mundane and awkward scenarios juxtaposed with some cartoony elements being used to derive humor, very simplistic and naturalistic dialogue. Look, Pim, I get what's going on here. They're, they're the bizarro versions of us. That's fine. But what's their endgame? What's the point of this? It's just pissing me off now. When you know he's storyboarded an episode of Spongebob, you can see it. The way he draws and exaggerates features is something that sticks out across his work. He co-wrote a lot of old JonTron videos and it shows throughout a lot of the humour presented. The thing that sticks out with Hellbenders is that it doesn't really have any of that and neither does anything prior to Hellbenders. The humour of those is mostly derived from being random and esoteric. Which is fine, I mean I find it funny. You probably thought I was going to shout at you, but I won't, because you're a cutie. But they're 30 second to minute long cartoons, where more often than that the joke boils down to just having violence and swearing be the punchline. And for what it's worth they're done well, but my point is that going into Hellbenders, a project that was super ambitious and meant to kickstart a jump from making 30 second long Skyrim animations to making a fully fledged season long TV show, they hadn't fully figured out their artistic identities. When explaining why the pilot looked so incomplete after 3 years, Zack cites one of the reasons being that he and Chris spent a lot of that time figuring out what the show was meant to be and rewriting old scripts until they were in a passable state. Earlier I tried explaining Hellbender's premise as simplistic as I could to try and give you all an idea of what the show is or what it's trying to be, which most commonly is referred to as an elevator pitch. Basically the idea being to pitch something within the short window of time you'd have waiting in an elevator. The focus is to be short, brief, and catch somebody's interest within a short amount of time. This happens in job interviews, in typical conversation, and most importantly when pitching something to a studio that you want to see get made. Adult Swim do short live streams that allow people to call in and pitch their show to a few people in the network. One of which featured Zach as one of the people listening in on the pitches. Right away it's evident that the people pitching have way too much crammed in to condense into a simple 5 to 30 second pitch. And Zach gave some sage advice to the guy. You have all these great ideas that could be done really, really badly on MS Paint, and they could be done amazingly. It's, get a hook, I think get a good tagline, that will convince people. What's a sentence that gets the audience, and if you tell the whole backstory, it, your brain starts to sizzle after a couple seconds. He's right. All good shows have a good pitch that you can explain within a couple of seconds without overcomplicating it that gets people to scratch their chin and go, ooh yeah, I'll check that out. Ned Flanders gets cancer and becomes a drug kingpin. Blind Lawyer fights crime and battles the kingpin. Everything can be pitched like that regardless of the premise, but there needs to be a hook that can keep an executive interested even if the pitch isn't exactly accurate. Edgar Wright wanted The World's End to be a film about an alcoholic with depression trying to deal with his life by recapturing the best night of his life with his estranged friends. But if you bring that to a studio who want butts and seats, they'll say no thank you and point to the door. So instead the pitch becomes, a group of friends reunite on a pub crawl and find their town has been taken over by aliens. Sold, where the hell do I sign? Hell, Aqua Teen Hunger Force was pitched as stupid cartoon characters solving mysteries, and that most definitely is not what the show's about. What does this have to do with Hellbenders you ask? Well, the show is not pitchable. Hellbenders is a show about two boy men who live together, who are stupid and are oblivious to the world around them and get up to weird things or weird people out. Which even when you boil it down to its most simplistic would sound like a boring or confusing show to pick up. And for that very reason probably wouldn't have been much of a success. Honestly that kind of content is the kind of thing that can only exist on the internet. The important thing to realise about television is that it's not looking to appeal to a niche and they want to amass as much of an audience as possible. Hellbenders is too fucking weird and all over the place to ever be something popular. I'm not saying people wouldn't enjoy it, I like Hellbenders, but I don't think it would have worked. And I don't think the two of them were ready to make that leap. 
both hadn't really found themselves creatively, gaining most of their fame from parody animations and skill that works very well for what they were doing, but is not exactly conducive to a TV format. Zack's trademarks are nowhere to be found. The designs are pretty simple, the humour is more revolved around being balls to the wall absurdist instead of the more natural kind of absurdism he later settled into, and all in all it just wasn't the right time for this kind of project. It is kind of sad that Hellbenders didn't get a chance on TV and that so many years of work went towards nothing, but I wouldn't say the experience was completely worthless. A while ago a movie came out called Tick Tick Boom, which is about the experience of a 30 year old playwriter, Jonathan Larson, trying desperately to create his own play that would propel him into being a success worthy of acclaim. And he fails. His first play was a flop, and while not bad, it went mostly ignored and didn't really amount to as much as he hoped. But the film points out that the struggle of an artist is to persevere past that struggle and to acknowledge that the obstacle is to throw stuff at the wall and see what sticks. Jonathan Larson and Zach Cadle both dedicated themselves to producing some kind of work that would leave them a lasting legacy and creative satisfaction, but the problem for both was that it just simply wasn't the right time. Zach wasn't experienced enough to try and make the jump to a completely different medium and format he didn't fully understand. Zach didn't have his comedic and artistic identity. He didn't possess a great knowledge of the industry and his hopes of making that jump were staggeringly ambitious. Afterwards though, Zach got more work in the industry and kept working on future pitches with other collaborators until eventually Eventually, the culmination of all his hard work came together in the form of Smiling Friends. You kissed your dad in the mouth? Zach came into the show with a more distinct style, more knowledge of the industry, and more experience in working as part of the system through work he's done for other companies, and at a point in his life where the jump feels more natural. And it shows. Watching Smiling Friends, you can see where a lot of the mistakes of Hellbenders were remedied. Zach is a more well-rounded creator, and that confidence is reflected in the show. Hellbenders felt like it was trying to have a joke every second without a minute spare to give the humour some breathing room. Which makes sense, when you're used to making 20 second long animations that are meant to have enough material to make it funny, then you're kind of forced to be fast paced. But that, in a 15 minute block of time, does not translate very well. Smiling Friends' humour leans much more into awkward absurdity. Part of the joke is that it's these stupid looking cartoon characters talking and acting as any other person would in these bizarre scenarios. I find it incredible that despite the show having a short runtime and a lot of moments of awkward silence, it's still able to have so many memorable jokes crammed into the 11 minutes, which is using the good parts of that 20 seconds of humour I talked about earlier. When you're just making one really short animation, you want to stuff it with as many gags as possible. Smiling Friends works so well because it marries the vibe of online animation with the best parts of traditional media. The best part of online animation to me is the fact that no matter what, you're getting the centralised vision of somebody who's working out of their bedroom. They don't have a big crew behind them, and it shows in a good way. You have the same guy taking up countless roles, there are jokes that were thought up in the moment, and people who do come in to provide help are all peers you have creative energy and a dynamic with. Traditional media's greatest asset, though, is that depending on budget, it allows its crew to make whatever comes to mind in a much larger scale, while still having to deal with new obstacles that test their creativity. Zack and Michael had a shoestring budget working on Smiling Friends of around $60,000 an episode. Which again, think about this. $10,000 is equivalent to about a minute of animation, and each episode of Smiling Friends is around 11 minutes, not including additional costs for editors, music and backgrounds. Working on the internet has its faults and issues, but one thing it causes you to be aware of is working with what you have. When you've got and have worked with so many talented one-man armies on the internet and then transition to something where there's so much bureaucracy and bullshit involved in accomplishing the most minuscule tasks, then as somebody from the internet you're going to be able to bring a lot more to the table. Hell, even Hellbenders understood this. Chris and Zack weren't just writers, they were animators, background artists, and even musicians. Zack and Michael were skimming through every frame of animation, every take from a voice actor, and were employing friends they made across the internet to help share the load. Look at the credits for any Smiling Friends episode and you'll see so many internet names show up. Oh sweet, Chris Oni and G did music, 3D animation and voice acting for the show. Harry Partridge voices several characters and is the voice in all the advertising for the show. Joshua Tomar is doing voices, uh, <laughs> that's cool, they're all on Oni Place together. The show is being animated by Studio Yotta, an animation studio founded by Newgrounds people who even did animation work for Hellbenders. You get people from the internet, they're going to be resourceful and they're going to be creative. That scrappiness reined in by having to adhere to a budget and the mandates of a studio can be a difficult mixture, but Smiling Friends accomplishes it really well, which could have only really happened on Adult Swim as 
the network has a history of allowing creators to thrive with minimal interference. They even fixed the pitch issue Hellbenders had, where it can only be sold as a show about nothing. Which is fine, but it makes for a really boring and confusing sell. Smiling Friends' elevator pitch is that it's a show about two colourful cartoon critters that are a part of a helpline dedicated to making people smile. That sounds so goofy and weird and interesting, I want to pick up this show. And the best part is, the show doesn't even have to be about that. The best episodes in this season had nothing to do with the Smiling Friends premise and were instead just random story ideas Zack and Michael thought up while they were writing. Zack has expressed that he wants the show to be a vehicle for whatever story he or Michael wants, which you can tell was the kind of thing he was going for with Hellbenders but didn't have a good enough hook to accomplish. It. Smiling Friends is just so creative and cool. It's got mixed media, varying art styles, a weird sense of humour, and I love it. It's the amalgamation of the lessons Zack learned throughout his career, especially when it came to his last attempt at this kind of project. I really hope this show gets picked up for another season, and I hope both Michael and Zack get the chance to keep pushing their creativity to get to new and bigger heights. Zack has talked a lot about his inspirations and where he wants his life to go in the next few years. On top of Zack's writing sensibilities, animation style and way of humour, above all I admire his work ethic and dedication to trying to make the best work he can with the time he has on this earth. He has goals he wants to aim for, and he has ambition to keep trying more and more stuff and move up the ladder. I really <laughs> admire Zack's goals and regardless of whether it sinks or swims, I'll always be there to keep supporting his stuff. I'm Typo. This is my channel. I'll eat the bug. This is the end. Like and subscribe. I love you.